Today I'm going to show you what's inside of the Ford SX engine and how it works. Now this is a 90 degree 3.9 liter V6 engine. Now this engine is out of a 2004 Ford Mustang and Ford's actually put this engine in many other vehicles such as the Ford F-150 pickup truck and the Windstar minivan. Now this engine supposedly has a blown head gasket given that milkshake that just came out of the oil pan and these engines are pretty notorious for being not reliable so we're going to tear this down to see just what caused the failure this engine was developed way back in the 70s which means that you still have an old iron block an aluminum pan and aluminum head but it's got an old school overhead valve design with push rods there's no camshaft sitting up inside of here now this is a very old school engine so i want you to just take a look at the lack of wiring across the top of this engine here everything's still mechanical including the fuel pump water pump and even the throttle is mechanical the only wiring you really have is just your ignition coil now i gotta apologize for the noise my neighbor's still working on their house i'm gonna start by removing some of these accessories up the front here next i'm gonna get the ac compressor all right and now we're gonna get the water pump off here all right i'm convinced ford's not doing their homework we've got a 15 here we've got a 12 here and two 10s here why are they switching sockets This oil cap kind of sounds like a gas cap when you tighten it. Next up, I'm going to get this ignition coil off. I'm just going to have a plug for the computer control. Looks like a 7 mil bolt. Pull that off and throw it in the garbage. All right, next up, I'm going to remove all the 8 millimeter bolts from the top of the intake here. All right, and now I'm going to remove that intake. Now here you can see Ford's variable intake runner system. We have an electric motor over here that runs these two mechanisms to either side. Inside of here you can see that there's these little flaps that completely lock off this entrance that goes into the intake. While this one is fully open, of course a wide open throttle, this is going to open up here to allow maximum airflow. And at minimum throttle, it's going to close off so we can allow for maximum swirl and mixing for better efficiency. All right, next we're going to remove the fuel rail. Let's get the SPI motor off here. And here you can see if I rotate that, that, that valve inside of there opens and closes at full throttle. Now because this is a later model version of this engine, they did have to outfit it with this EGR valve over here and the pipe that goes down to the back. See, it's just literally going to pipe exhaust gases directly back into the intake here. There's no coolers or any electronic valve. And I'll just bend that out of the way. And there's no way I'm going to get it off that end. Now I'm going to go ahead and remove the lower intake manifold. These are all 8 mils. All right, let's see now if we can remove this intake. There we go, we've got a plastic gasket. All right, taking a look down inside of the intake here. First of all, you can see that there is a balance shaft. That's because this is a 90 degree V6 as opposed to a typical 60 degree V6. And that means that they had to make some changes to the crankshaft and the balance shaft here would definitely help with vibrations. You can see the intake material here is made of plastic and it's also got some of that milkshake material that we saw in the oil pan. So things are not really looking very good for this engine, even just up at the top here. Further down inside of there, you can see there's these push rods and those are gonna take energy from the camshaft which is down underneath here and bring it up inside of the head to attack the valve camshafts are not actually located inside of the heads themselves obviously the advantage is simplicity but then you can't have things like variable valve tap and you lose out on a lot of efficiency potential all right pray that i can get these exhaust manifold bolts out oh no there's a dipstick in the way Let's see how long i'm gonna have to fight this to oh that was one of the easiest dipsticks ever all right and there's the manifold and the steel exhaust gasket pretty much the same thing on the passenger side here all right, we're going to pull the valve cover next and you'll see just a very simple valve cover with one PCV hole. It's not made of plastic, no wires, no high pressure fuel pump, no variable valve timing solenoids. Just a very simple valve cover. Ta-da! Oh, there's some milkshake inside of there. Now looking inside of the valve cover, it actually doesn't look too bad. This engine had 300,000 kilometers on it, but you can definitely tell there's been coolant mixing inside of this oil here. So I wonder which side of the head gasket is blown. The other theory is that the coolant, the other theory is that the coolant's been working away at the oil deposits, kind of steam cleaning everything. You can see we've also got these push rods, which are going to push against this rocker arm, and that's going to push down on the valve itself. You can see that there's only three cylinders on this side, which means that you have two, four, six, only two valves per cylinder. So once again, you're very limited by the amount of air that can enter and exit this head. All right, we're here on the driver's side head here. Yeah, definitely some more milkshake in this one. All right, I'm going to go ahead and remove the rocker arms. And I can also take out these little push rods here. They should be straight. If they're bent, then something's wrong with this engine. Something tried to push something that wasn't supposed to go somewhere. It's kind of a dumb design. They put the stud right in front of the head bolt. But if you take a socket, you can actually turn these studs out 
can't imagine what you'd have to do if one of these studs broke. Head bolts on these are just a very simple 15 millimeter socket. No complicated torques or splines or anything. They're pretty tight though. <laughs> I gotta get the bar for this one. Alright, now I'm gonna gun these off. See if we can take this head off here. Alright, here we are on the driver's side head. I'm gonna break these bolts loose. Just zip these off here. Now head gaskets don't often show an obvious failure point, but they can fail in many ways. Sometimes the inner layer will be compromised or the head overheats and warps very slightly, allowing coolant from the outside here to enter the oiling system, either through the combustion chamber or through the drain back holes. And you can see the head gasket itself here has a lot of crust on it built up. That's a little bit of corrosion as well as some of that coolant and oil mixing together, but there's no obvious like tear in this gasket. However, if I do look at the piston tops themselves, I do notice that this piston is a lot cleaner than the other two which would indicate that there's some coolant entering this cylinder at some point same thing over here on the passenger side you can see that it's really really crusty especially in between this middle cylinder here which is a little bit cleaner than the other two cylinders now the best way to determine the head gasket failure is obviously through a compression check Likewise on the passenger head you can see some of the carbon has been cleaned off from the intake valve on this side where the other two are still black. You can see that front cylinder also had a little cleaning going on with that one while the other two are relatively black. I already cracked the crank bolt loose. Pull this off. We get this oil filter out of here. Oh goodness. There's more milk dripping out. No! I got my wife's old dress here. I'm gonna sap up the driveway first. And that's why I use a plastic underneath here to try and save my driveway. Alright, I want to pull this front timing cover next. So I have to pull two oil pan bolts first. Crank sensor. This little tap here. Here goes the timing cover. Cool, there's a little gear in there for like a speed sensor. Oh, that's probably for the tachometer. And there's actually a timing chain. Now the timing system on the overhead valve engine is very simple. You just have crank, camshaft. One chain, that's it. And there's a tensioner. Now there are these plastic slides inside of here that are backed with metal, which is good because it'll be nice and strong. Let's see if I can crack this cam bolt loose here. Awesome. Should be able to slide this out and slide this out at the same time. And then we could pop the timing set off. Now let's get the tensioner off. Tension is really simple, it's just two slides. There's no hydraulics, there's no springs, there's nothing involved. In. I can pop off this intermediary gear here that hangs out on the camshaft. Balance shaft, however, is kind of held in by these two torques. I don't know what's up with Ford and using torques. <coughs> I can just pop that balance shaft right out. Looks like I got another set of torques here that hold the camshaft. Okay, now I can zip those off. Pop off this flange. And then I can pull out the camshaft. So inside of here we have lifters. We're actually doing the contact to the camshaft. I'm going to go ahead and remove that. And now we have these lifters. The lifters themselves has a little roller on it and that's going to help roll along the surface of the camshaft as this thing is moving up and down against the push rod which sits in here. So I'll just pull all of these out of here. There should be a total of 12 because this has six cylinders and there's only two valves per cylinder. Poopy fingers, so slippery. I've got the lifters out of there, I can remove the camshaft. This is going to take a bit of wiggling. I buy all the bearings. Wiggle, wiggle. There we go. Cool looking camshaft. I could probably make a lamp out of that. All right, so the block stripped down. I'm going to go ahead and turn this engine over. Oh, more cool. I'm going to go ahead and remove all the eight millimeter bolts going around the oil pan. I'm actually quite surprised that Ford used an aluminum oil pan on this thing. All right, pop that off. It's a really deep oil pan. Oh, look at that milkshake inside of there. Yeah, coolant definitely mixed with oil. And you can see we have aftermarket RTV, so this pan's been resealed. I'll probably clean this up and make it into a little toy box for my daughter. Check out all that junk in the oil pickup tube. I'm surprised this engine actually made it to 300,000 kilometers. I'm going to take off the oil pickup first. All right, I'm going to remove all these 13s here for this little baffle that they have. And they even put Ford Motor Company on there, stamping all of their parts with this kind of junk. I guess we can remove this baffle or brace. So here's where you can kind of see the uniqueness in a 90 degree V6 engine. Because the pistons are now positioned further apart, you have to reposition the connecting rod relative to this crankshaft here. And that's why you have this offset between these connecting rods here. And that's to give you an even flow of power as the engine is cycling using the same firing order. In a normal 60 degree engine, these would actually share a connecting rod journal. What I don't like is that they're using studs instead of bolts on these main caps. So I'm going to actually have to use a wrench because I don't have a socket that big. 
So now I've cracked the main nuts loose here. I'm gonna go ahead and crack the bolts for the connecting rods. These are an 11 millimeter. Now I'll just go ahead and zip these free here. Pull off these connecting rod caps. All right, and now I'm gonna push this piston down here. Whoa, this is a giant piston. I guess because it's 3.8 liters over only six cylinders and not eight. Oh boy, that last piston came up with a whole bunch of slurry on it. Most of the rod bearings look okay, but when you come to cylinder number four here, you can definitely tell there's been a lot of scoring. Its associated bearing here also has a lot of scoring on it. So this one probably took the hit when it came to mixing coolant with the oil and started to chew through the bearing. However, luckily it didn't chew the crankshaft and that's in pretty good shape. I'm just gonna wind off these main cup nuts. And then I gotta remove these bearings. The bearing looks pretty clean. This one's got a little scoring on it. Yeah, this one's not the best. It's got a big score on it. This is the one with the thrust washer. And this one also has a few lines on it as well. Now the rear bearing also integrates the cap for the rear main seal, which is this guy over here. Okay, finally I'm gonna remove the crankshaft from the block. So here I've got all the components laid out here. Let's take a closer look at how this Ford Mustang engine works. Starting at the bottom here, we do have a cast aluminum oil pan. Very simple design, nothing integrated inside. It is fairly strong, although these are more brittle than a stamped steel design, but at least they won't rust. Next up, we have a really long oil pickup tube, and you can see it's seen better days. This little screen here is all clogged up from a lot of junk and sludge, as well as the oil and coolant mixing together from that head gasket failure. Now the oil pickup tube is gonna bring oil to the bottom of the block, and then back out here to the oil pump assembly, which sits on top. And here's a look at that oil pump assembly which is actually part of the timing cover you can see oil is going to come in through here it'll get filtered out over here the pump assembly is actually integrated into here the oil is going to flow back into the block over here this gear here which was driven by that gear behind the camshaft is what actually drives the oil pump take this thing apart real quick see what's inside I just had an 8 mil and now I had to change it to a 10 mil I don't like how Ford's using different fasteners for the same part you can see it's a gear style oil pump. It's got a lot of that milk material inside of there. You can see how this works here as this rotates, the oil is gonna come in and be squeezed into these gears over here, which is gonna generate that oil flow. And we've got the shaft over here with this helical gear on it that interfaces with that one in the camshaft, which is gonna drive all of this. Now that filter oil is then going to come in over here and be sent down to the front crank bearing over to power these two oil galleys that run the length of the block. There's also a small little galley here that lubricates the front cam bearing. And if you follow those oil galleys, you'll see on this side here that they run right through this lifter setup over here where the push rods kind of plug into. That means that these are going to get lubricated as they move up and down. But furthermore, the camshaft bearings which are inside of here also tap off of this oil galley that runs the length of the engine on both sides. Now while the camshaft is being lubricated up above, there's also taps over here drilled into the crankshaft to lubricate it and the connecting rod bearings. Oh yeah, also stealing oil from the camshaft is this balance shaft bearing on this side and on the back of the block. There's a lot of these freeze plugs back here. Now this engine does use a semi-closed block design which is really good because you can pump a lot of power through this. Obviously it's not going to be as good for cooling though because you don't have a full water jacket running all the way around that interfaces with the head. Check out the fins on the back of this water pump here. If it ain't shaped like a D, it's not going to work. Looking at the crankshaft, as I mentioned before, you do have this offset between here because this is a 90 degree v6 engine a 90 degrees are mostly used in v8s because that's the way the power will balance now because this offset is here it's really really thin between these two connecting rods although there's only axial force here and nothing twisting or bending this crankshaft i feel like if there was a catastrophic failure it would probably occur right here and here's the real reason why these engines are in the junkyard it's these heads because these heads are aluminum and the block is steel you have different coefficients of expansion and that's going to cause a slight warpage in the head gasket the head gasket can no longer hold the seal between the combustion chamber and the coolant chambers and then you have a blown head gasket and that's where the coolant gets to mix with the oil and then you have that milkshake slurry that we saw in the oil pan. Now the SX V6 engines used to blow head gaskets a lot and were notorious for it. That's why they all end up in the junkyard, especially in the old Tauruses and the Windstars and even the Mustang as you see here. The other thing is those vehicles aren't worth much, especially a V6 Mustang. Nobody really wants those. Everybody wants the V8 because it's a sports car after all. So most people will just swap this out for something else like an LS or a Coyote motor. You see the other thing is these engines don't make that much power. They're very old school in their design. You can see this is the intake and that's the exhaust valve and there's only two valves per cylinder a lot of modern engines are going for four or five valves per cylinder you'd be lucky if you can hit 190 stock horsepower with this now because of Ford's variable intake system you do have two runners per cylinder and you'll notice that one of them are really clean 
while the other one there is really dirty. You have the port injection only going into the one runner, whereas the other one remains dirty. The back of the valves, however, do look pretty clean, so that's okay, but that's not really ideal for the airflow. The other thing is the SPI system is turning on and off one set of these valves, which means that when your EGR kicks in, it's just going to gum up the one side as opposed to the other. Now speaking about the injectors, this fuel rail design is kind of weird. They have a flex hose in the front and a flex hose in the back. Kind of like an H-shaped design, so it sort of balances out the pressure. Usually most systems will just have a U-shaped design without this cross pipe. You can, however, also tell that this is an old school design by the look of the piston. You'll see that the oil control ring is nice and big, which means that it won't get clogged up really fast and it allows the oil to flow back. You've also got nice, big, heavy-duty compression rings, and this thing does feel pretty solid. The piston itself is actually pretty clean. There's a little bit of scoring on the side here for some piston slap but for 300,000 kilometers I think it did pretty well. Now the bores inside of the cylinders are actually pretty clean as well there's no evidence of piston slap or scoring or lack of lubrication. Now this camshaft here that sits in the block is nice and simple because it just uses push rods you don't have to deal with any timing chains in the head so when you know that head gasket is gonna fail you obviously don't need to deal with any chains or timing the engine. It does however limit you quite a lot because you can only run two valves per cylinder there's not enough room to do anything here and you can't have things like variable valve time and VTEC. Ignition coils are another weak point of this engine and they burn out pretty quickly. I can tell this one's not original. There's no Ford part logos on it. You also can see the three distinct coils inside of here. You'd have to double fire per cylinder. Replacing this part's pretty straightforward and easy. Luckily it doesn't use a distributor or even a carburetor for that matter. And that's a look inside of the Ford SX engine and how it works. Make sure you check your head gaskets every time you fill up your gas and subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.